Welcome back to Applied Houdini for Rigids 1, version 2, Fundamentals. In this lesson, we're going to talk about really understanding at a deep level how rigid bodies work and are represented in Houdini. We'll start with the foundations of packed instancing, transformations, fracturing, go over constraints and important dynamics properties, and work up to using Houdini's RBD toolset to tackle more complex setups faster than ever before. As usual, the goal is for you to understand how and why things work the way they do so that you can further customize and problem solve on your own. By the end, we'll even render it so it looks kind of nice. Hope you enjoy it. So first things first, we need to talk about what, how rigid bodies are represented in Houdini. Uh, rigid bodies in general are, you know, individual objects. They collide with each other. They're constrained to each other and all that good stuff. But in Houdini, by default, whether or not you're familiar with Houdini yet, um, you need to know that when you're working with geometry, you know, there are a bunch of individual polygons and points and, and all that stuff. And that's fine when we're doing geometry manipulation. But when we have multiple objects, say like, here we go, I now have eight of these pig heads, like so. They're a little small, but there you go. These are not really individual objects still. In Houdini, it's still just a pile of polygons. You know, before we had 2,000 or almost 3,000 polygons. Now I've got a lot more. It's still just a bunch of polygons and points, and they they happen to be separated by distance and things. But unlike other software packages, let's say like Maya or Max or Blender or whatever, um, in those packages, usually you're dealing with objects that have geometry, but they also have uh, a transform which means where the individual object is in space, how it's oriented, meaning its rotation and all that jazz. And so Houdini has a notion of packed geometry. So if I were to take my original pig head here, again, polygons and points, and I'm going to turn on this pack node, now you'll see it says only one point, one primitive, one pack geo. So what, where did the geometry go? Well, clearly nowhere. It's still here. But it's now inside of a package. Literally, you could take the cue from their little icon. The geometry now lives inside of a briefcase. It's going on its little trip to rigid body world. And what's really nice about this is it does two things. One is that now that it's one point, it'll have one position in space, and it'll actually uh, store its orientation as well. So if I were to move this around, I could make a transform node, for example, here. And I could move it, rotate it. You know, it's still obviously one thing. But now it is baseline. It is the original polygons and points. And then packed up, moved to new location, and all the polygons and points move are inside of it. They're inside the briefcase, remember? And now they're here. In fact, if I unpack it, I'll get them back. And they'll just be now in their new location. But now it's not a object anymore. Now it's just back to the just general pile of polygons and points. So let's turn this off again for a second. One of the nice things about having this, not only do we get an individual orientation and location, we also get to instance this thing. So if I were to have two of them, or three of them, it still only has a memory footprint of just one of the pig heads. And then in the new locations and orientations, Houdini just knows what should this look like? Oh, just look back to the original definition, again, this, before it was packed. Look back to that definition, and then I'm the same as that one. So we don't need to duplicate data. So what do I mean by that? Well, here I am as we started to see, we have eight of these things. And we have eight times as much data because we have to store all of it. In fact, if I were to split this top and bottom and set it to, they reorganize this here in Udini 18, go to Inspector's Geometry Spreadsheet. Here is the data. There's so much of it. We don't really need it. A lot of it's redundant. It's the same definition of a pig head over and over again, but we've, we're storing it eight times, and it's, it's not necessary. So if I were to, let's say, have more of these. So I'm using a box, and I'm instancing, or I'm rather, I'm copying these things. That's the problem. We're not instancing. Copying them onto this. So as I increase this box, 
and I have more points, I get more and more of these pig heads, more and more data. I'm going to open up my task manager here, go to memory. So if I go to, I'll bring it back in a second. Let's say if I make this 25 by 25 by 25, watch how the memory, it's still thinking about this. It's going to take time. It's a lot of work for it to do. It's taking up more and more memory, more and more memory. Look at that. It's just, you know, it's unnecessary to have this much duplicated memory. And this is going to matter for rigid bodies too, because in rigid body sims, a lot of times you have duplicate pieces. If you have one wall that you fracture into fractured components, but you use that same wall many times, we don't need to use more memory. And that allows us to have way more detailed sims because we're not actually using more memory. Still, we'll still use processing power to see where they all collide, but saving memory is important. So there you go. We've just jumped up. And if I look at this, we now have 50 million polygons, 50 million points. It's just a real huge waste of data. And again, just imagine all this data being saved into memory. We don't have to imagine it, it's right there. So that's fine, but if I pack this, you'll see it just kicks all that RAM out and it's done immediately. Look how fast it did it too. We didn't have to wait all that time. So we have a few things going on here. So we're seeing instances of one memory footprint, one pig's worth, and then it's just stamping it everywhere. And you see all these black cubes? That's another nice thing that we get to take advantage of. Because it knows that these are individual items, each with their own bounding box, which is a cube you could draw around the piece, we can do scene optimizations like that, where we don't have to draw them all. So I can turn that on and off, press D in the viewport, go to optimize, you can turn off distance based geometry culling, and then when I move the camera again, it still moves pretty fast. Uh, so you might as well keep it on. We get the same idea, much faster. So again, faster, less memory, and it essentially is the same. When I render this out of a renderer, these won't be cubes, these will be the actual thing. So that's what packed geometry is in a nutshell. Um, the one little tricky thing about it in terms of you know, just being comfortable with Houdini and the data management side of it is if we look at that geometry spreadsheet again, the position is obvious. P, P for position, X, Y, and Z. Where's the orientation? The orientation is actually stored in this other place, over on the primitives themselves. They're actually stored redundantly, the position and the orientation, in a thing called the packed full transform. So packed, we know what that means. Transform means the rotation, scale, uh, translation, meaning the position, and also shear, meaning like a warped thing that nobody ever uses. That's stored here. Wow, what is that? It's crazy. It's 16 numbers. It's a four by four matrix, a grid of numbers that stores all the things that I just said. Let's actually talk about, let's, let's try to visualize that and talk about and appreciate what that is now in the next chapter. So it's very important to understand what a transformation is. It is not important to understand what the math is or anything like that. So fortunately, you're not gonna have to learn any math here. That said, identifying and understanding what it is is still very important because this is the data. I always imagine it's like a little card. It's like a business card that says the address of where this object should go, which again is going to be the, the size of it, the translation of it, and so on. So I broke it down here by uh, what the components mean and color. So this, by default, with all the zeros and the one down the diagonal, it's called the identity matrix, which simply means just stay where you are. Don't change. Don't change size, don't rotate, don't move. Now the green right here is the translation, meaning the actual just location in space. So if I were to move this, you'll see it changes. I'm not applying any rotation or anything, so nothing else really changes here. Now what else we got? These numbers down here, or rather the whole red box is the rotation of it, but the diagonal also in the box is the size of it. So if I were to make it bigger and smaller, so here I am making it bigger, you'll see those numbers change. Then that's because I'm making it bigger and smaller on all three axes, X, Y, and Z. If I were to make it bigger just on the X axis here, just this one changes. And isn't that interesting? Just this column here 
seems to represent just the x changing, and this one's just the y changing, and so on. Um, now that's going to matter because when we rotate it, so I'm going to put this back to 1, 1, and 1. If they rotate it, everything's changing. But it still is actually in terms of x, y, and z. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I were to take a look at this, so see, this is the y. So again, y is the green one here. And we said that this is the y. So what is this saying? x, y, z. So within the y component, the y is pointing straight up. So 0, 1, 0 means point up along the y-axis, which of course is what the y-axis does. So again, x is 0, y is 1, and so on. Now if I were to rotate this to the right, let's say I rotate it all the way to the right. Why am I in wireframe mode? Let's say I rotate it all the way to the right, 90 degrees. Now we're back to some nice, easy to understand zeros and ones again. So the y-axis, which is still this column, is now says 1, 0, 0. And look at that. The x-axis points to the right, which that y which used to be up here, now points to the right. So it's set, what, the, what this is saying is it's saying, when you apply me, the old y-axis now points this direction. The old x-axis now points this direction. And the old z-axis now points this direction. In fact, the old x-axis, 0, negative 1, 0, we can see that that is true. The x-axis, which used to point over here, now points down. Now those are easy to understand unit vectors meaning they have a length of 1. Um, as we rotate it around and such, they're all still unit vectors, really. But now, now looking at this, it's just hard to really see what we're seeing. And again, we never really need to do the math. But that's what this is. It's a very succinct way of saying, this is your new rotation. You go from your old one to being oriented this way now, each of your axes. You actually literally exist in this new spot and perhaps you're bigger or smaller now, like so. So that's pretty cool. Now that's us just changing these numbers around. If we were to actually run the sim, that's, this is why it's important. Is that this is what the rigid body solve is doing. On every frame, it's coming up with a new location for the pieces, and then it settles. So it's not surprising that when it lands, the y-axis is pointing straight up and down again because it's resting on the ground, but it still has this 1.4 because remember we, we scaled it up to 1.4. So there you go. So that's, that's the whole thing. So that's being stored internally. We don't need to manipulate that ourselves, but we can use it. And this is why it's important to know that these things exist. The whole point of Applied Houdini is that you understand what's going on under the hood. Side effects is always going to keep changing and updating their software, which is great. But it does mean that you can't just rely on a tutorial, whether it's this one or any of them, to be, you know, whatever the newest tools, whatever the newest RBT, RBD workflow thing is, those things will change, or you'll need just need to make your own thing in general. I mean, that's even more common. You have a need to, to make your own tool. So the point is, you need to know, ultimately, what is going on here, and then you don't have to wait for side effects. You can fix it or build it yourself. So what am I saying here? <laughs> I'm saying we can take something like this. So here's a pig head, right? I can move it to where this is, right? Because remember, this is it's just an address. This is just an address of where to move a thing to. So I can move, even though I calculated it on the cube, I can move anything to that. So here I am moving the pig head to that. Now, I know you might be getting scared if you see some code over here, and we're not going to learn this code today, so don't worry. This is just a demo. But I want you to understand that we can move anything to anything else. And if you are interested, I'll say real quick, remember when I said packed full transform is what stores that? I'm simply saying get it, store it in the letter M, and then say the positions move to where M is. That's what this is saying. We multiply the position times the matrix. In fact, just for fun, you can see how it's doing it per point. So as I, you know, for some reason I just thought it'd be fun to do it this way. 
we it's doing it per point it's not you know an individual object in this mode it's just points and prims as we said before but that's ultimately how an entire object gets moved into another space every single point gets moved into that space and so on and so forth so that's what's going on here um, I hope that makes sense if you don't understand all of that that's fine you just basically need to understand that there is a thing called a transform it stores the size it stores the shear which again we don't usually use uh, the location and the rotation and then we can use that transform to move other things the most common way this comes up is almost what you're seeing right here see it looks like the pig head is being simulated but it's not a proxy object so if you're used to other packages you'll understand that notion at least you often simulate a simplified version of something and then simply apply the high res one there it would be very difficult to fully accurately simulate this pig head there's so many little polygons on it that would all have to have their own collision detections but we don't need to do that if we simulate a low res version again the cube and apply the transform to the high res version and that's literally what we're going to do in this lesson and that's why you need to know about packed pieces and that's why you need to know about transforms so now let's get into the actual fun part of the lesson all right so here we are actually now going to do it ourselves and by ourselves i mean yourselves so go to project set or new project we'll call it something like ridges one version two in case you've been with me since ridges one's version one You'll need a unique name for it. Now let's save it as Rigid's one version one. No, version two. I already just confused myself. Very good. And then, so here we go. We have a 240 frames. <clears throat> that's 10 seconds, and uh, it's too much. So let's bring that down to like 96 frames. Because we're going to render it later. And honestly, 96 frames is fine. So there you go. We have our project that's 96 frames long. We are in the object context here, which is what we want. Let's make an object. Let's make a geometry node, which is going to store our rigid bodies in it. It's going to store pretty much everything we're going to do in it today. In fact, I'm going to call it the sim. So now we're not actually in the simulation context. Now we're in the place where we can build up our, our nodes and our geometry and such. But we'll, we'll get, obviously, to the simulations. So pig head, so press tab, pig, spell pig correctly. There it is. So there it is again, just like from the demo, easy enough. I'm going to say, let's, let's pack it immediately. Uh, I'm going to use an assemble node here. So we just tend to use these in rigids for a variety of reasons. They have some convenient stuff inside of them. But ultimately, they do create packed geometry if you turn that on. You'll notice the texture disappears in the viewport. Don't worry. Um, renders like Mantra and things, we can still set it to, to render that material later. But just so you know, it's OK that it disappeared. Obviously, we can see the geometry anyway. So we middle click and hold. We have one packed fragment, which is the same more or less as a packed piece. Uh, I'm not going to get into the technical difference. It's a memory management thing. But as far as we're concerned, it's still a packed thing. So it doesn't really matter. Still is a packed full transform and all that stuff. OK. So there you go. Um, we've got a pig head. Let's move it around. So I'm going to make a transform. Now remember, we need to move it after we pack it. I'm going to move it up four. And I'm turn this back on if it was, it was off for some reason. So we're going to have it fall and simulate like that. Easy enough. So make a dop network. And I might hear you screaming out there. Yes, there are there is a new there are new convenient ways of doing this, and we will get to them in this very lesson, maybe in even a half hour from now. But for now, I need you to understand what is going on under the hood. That's the whole point of this. So we're going to make our own dot network and do it ourselves. So go inside of it, and we're going to make an RBD packed object. The geometry source is the first context geometry. In fact, if I look at it, I click on this. 
And there it is. The first context geometry means this first input here. Very good. So that is a container, it's an object, it's a container that stores various simulation things. In our case, there's a geometry subdata, which is what we just read into it, and that's going to be the thing that is simulated. Now the way it is simulated, like if I press play now, nothing happens. Because there's just an object, but nothing to move it around, or as we often say, evolve it in the simulation. So put a rigid body solver down, connect that to this, we can look at that, press play now, it takes a little bit longer to do, but there's still nothing to do, although it is technically simulating it, there's no forces, there's no gravity or anything. So here's gravity, now it'll just fall forever into the void, and let's give it a ground plane, which is kind of a convenience thing as a collider. I mean, we can define our own custom colliders later, but you often just want a regular infinitely large ground plane. So it's just a nice thing to have. So I made a merge node here. By default, it says collide, and the left affects the right. Just change this to mutual because we just don't want to, we don't want to get the order wrong and then it doesn't work. So there you go. That's it. So we made our first sim. Pretty easy. It wasn't that scary. We didn't need to rely on the built-in RBD tools to make this. It was pretty straightforward. Again, to recap, we had geometry. We put it inside a little box. We packed it so it has a transform. We moved it to some arbitrary starting position. We loaded it into the sim, into the simulation object. We, set, we have it have gravity. It doesn't matter where this, like some of these things are kind of malleable where you can put them. Like this could go here it wouldn't matter. We're just setting up a relationship in here where we say, this object is solved by this thing. Same thing, I could put this here. Which is then saying, this object and this object are solved by this. But the ground plane doesn't do anything, so it doesn't really matter. But so this is solved by this. This has gravity. If I had gravity here, it means the ground plane is subject to gravity. But again, it can't move, so it doesn't matter. Is it just, it's just an interesting way of saying how things are related to each other. The ground plane collides with any objects that come in from this. This is the only object coming in, so this is colliding with this because of this. And the output, of course, means that this is what comes out of the sim. This is what you usually want to have your little orange flag on. If you keep your orange flag on something else, that is the output of the sim. If I wanted just the ground plane to be the output of the sim, it could do that, but why? So there you go. So that's that. On our sim itself, it's going to object merge back in everything. I would probably only want anything with RBD in the name, which is this. I don't want the ground plane. On its own, the ground plane was coming in. So when this said star, we were getting all the objects that were in there. To be clear, the ground plane is also an object. It's just not being solved for. So there you go, we've got a simulation. Now, one last thing I would like to say is the object itself has a variety of things that are interesting about it. So for example, if we go to the bullet data tab on the RBD packed object, we can do show guide geometry. What is this crazy thing? This is what's actually colliding in our solver. It's not colliding this crazy high risk thing. Remember when I was saying with the box and all that? Bullet uses what are called convex hulls. As you can see, the geometry representation by default is a convex hull, and that's what this is. You could change it to other things. You could have a box, and you can see it's, it's only that that's being solved. I can make it be a, a cylinder, and you know, in the high res, it's just moving along with it, because remember, the transform is just being applied to that thing. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Uh, these are actually very useful to use. If you have spheres, they solve very fast, so the fastest thing that can be solved. They're very simple, they're just a point and a radius. Convex hulls are still pretty fast, for reasons I won't get into. You can do concave, but it doesn't work that well. I mean, it works fine, I guess, for one piece, but once you have a lot of stuff, it, it's gonna slow to a crawl and may not even work at all. Really, you should be setting your things up with a mind towards it being convex hull, which is why it's the default. 
A convex hull means that you never have a concave angle, meaning you never have a dip or a depression anywhere. Obviously, this is a big dip coming around here, but it's just flattened out. So that's what's going on in the hood. And later in the lesson, we will make our own proxy geometry that better represents the piece, but um, it's still not as high res as this. But in any case, so that is what's actually colliding under the hood. And you should also know there's various uh, properties that individual pieces can have. Things like bounce and friction. We'll talk a little bit more about those, but they do what you'd think they would. If I turn this up quite a bit, wee, goodbye. <laughs> Does crazy stuff. I mean, you know, the default of one is, or 0.5 is probably fine, but sometimes, you know, if you really want something to thud against the ground, you want to do zero. Although even zero will still bounce a little bit. You'll need to use drag and things like that if you want to completely get rid of a bounce. Friction we can't really see right now. Um, we'll see that later, but that's where it is. And the mass itself, we can either explicitly say how heavy it is, or we can have it computed for us based on a density. Uh, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But there you go. We've made our first sim, and now let's talk about how to break this, this thing up to make a, a fractured sim with the Voronoi. So Voronoi is one of the most commonly used fracture algorithms out there. Um, we're still going to use it here, mostly to create our proxy geometry, but nonetheless, still super, super important because Voronoi fractures create convex pieces. As we just saw, convex is what Bullet wants. So how does Voronoi work? Basically, we have our geometry that we want to fracture. We will put points, scatter points in space, usually inside of the object itself. And those points will define where the, what we'll call cells, what the actual resulting fractured pieces are. Now, how that works is interesting. So if I put two points into this, we can kind of see how that works. We have two pieces now. It's not that the points define the center necessarily of the pieces, like as you can see. This is clearly not the center of this piece. But as you maybe you've been can kind of see, all of the space in the in the object that is closest to this point is this point's piece. So, like all this area out here, obviously this area out here is closer to this point than it is closer to this point. So it's all being tagged essentially as this point's piece. Now as you get to the halfway distance between the two points, obviously this area right here is closer to this point. So it's tagged with him. So all of this becomes his. And as we add points to it, like so, we get more complicated results. But it's still true that all of this region here is closest to this point. All of this region here is closest to this point. And the dividing lines are always going to be at these halfway points between the various points. We have these lines here too to help you visualize it. You can kind of see how it's it's always the line is always perpendicular to that line. Even when that line crosses over other things here, it's still this line here, down here, that's being defined by that. So the point is, once again, you don't need to do this math yourself, but it is interesting to see. If you cluster points over in one area, you'll get smaller pieces in that area. So this is a common thing. If this had to fall on that corner, we wanted to fracture in that area more than out here, we would cluster our points over there. So. If you really wanted to go for it, we have 20 points. And again, as it moves through, you can see how the, this, the cell moves with it. Pretty cool. These are all convex. Again, they don't have any dips or anything like that. And the same applies to the 3D one. So if we were to look at the 3D, I'm in ortho mode. 
There we go. Actually, very good. We're already 3D. Anyway, here we go. Applied to a 3D object, you can see all these pieces are convex. And the way that we came up with this is we had a box. We turned it into a volume, which is a common thing. The volume, we then put points inside of it. So you can see the points live inside the box that we're fracturing. And then we fracture it, and then there you go. You can see how the points are more or less, they're, they're kind of roughly in the center, but not always as we saw. But the point is more that, there you go. As we change the amount of points that we're doing here, it's a very fast algorithm. It chops things up really fast, and the more of these things that we have, the more pieces that we get. Pretty cool. So that's how Voronoi works. So let's actually use that now to do our first fracture. So back here in this world, let's put this to use. So I'm going to continue working in, in the area that we were before. So come back up to the pig head itself. We need to make that volume, the one that we scattered the points into that we just saw. We can do a VDB from polygons, like so. A VDB is a kind of volume. Turn off distance VDB, we want a fog VDB. It's kind of hard to see. If you like, you can press D, go to background tab and change it to dark, like so. We can make this, the voxel size smaller. I mean, we talk about voxels for days over in the volumes one lesson, which is also free, if you want to know more about volumes, but we're not going to do deal with volumes that much right now, other than to get a better representation of this, we need to make this voxel size smaller. But now we're done with it already. So we're going to scatter into this. I'm going to make 20, just 20. Because remember, these are going to define where our fractured cells are going to be. So we have 20 points, drop down a Voronoi fracture. This is one of the bigger changes since the last Rigid's one, uh, Rigid's one applied to Dini lesson. This, this node got redone, and now it's it's faster, it's newer, and it actually has less options now. They split it out into a few different nodes. In any case, like before, drop it in, put your pieces into it, and there you go. We now have it fractured. Am I okay? I put it in smooth shaded. I want to see those lines. Okay, so there it is. It's kind of it's kind of hard to tell that it got fractured. There's two things you can do. You can click on this, which will make a visualizer, which is right here. It made a name-based visualizer. The Voronoi fracture makes names, primitive attribute. So the name is a kind of data that every single polygon, because it gets is not packed yet, packing comes later. Right now we're in regular geometry mode. Every polygon that's within the same piece has the same name. So if I, again, split this top and bottom, and set the paint tab type to be inspector geometry spreadsheet. This is the point data here. If I move over two buttons to this one, here is the primitive data, meaning the polygon data. So you can see many polygons have the same name. There are about 20 pieces. There's apparently more than 20 pieces, but that's fine. So there you go. If I drop down an exploded view, the exploded view uses that name attribute. Now you could change it. We could change uh, the name of the attribute, but it's we might as well just use the defaults. Okay. So there you go. So there's our, our broken up thing. Now I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna put our color scheme back here so we can see uh, an issue. There's black faces on the inside here because this material, the pig head material that we can see, these are new faces now on the inside. They didn't used to exist. You know, back when it was this, obviously there was no inside. But now that there's inside, it's trying to apply the pig head material to the inside. But the inside's UVs, which is kind of a, if you don't know what UVs are, don't worry. But all I want to say is, we have new faces, we want to create a material and not use the pig head material with the texture. 
So as a quick diversion, go to the material palette, create a principled shader. I don't know what that's about. And that's enough. We'll, we'll call it, we'll go to the mat area here and we'll call it inside. And that's, that's enough. And then we can go back with OBJ into here and say with a material sop, let's overwrite, let's not use the pig head for the inside. Literally, there's a group called inside. The Voronoi fracture made that group for us, interior group. So all of the new faces on the inside are there. So if I go here, or rather, let's, let's hook that exploded view up to our material, and let's set that new material we just made that's in the matte area. And now we can see it's just this white now. And we'll be able to control that material but it's way better than that, and it'll actually render, and it looks like something nice now. So let's save that. And if we look at the assemble, we now have 22 packed fragments. There are 22 pieces in this thing. It made 22, because once again, um, it's gonna use the name. Or actually, by default, it's gonna look at the connectivity. It's gonna determine that there are 22 different pieces. Let's turn this create name attribute off. We don't need to create a name. It already had a name. I would rather use the names that the Voronoi fracture came up with. So again, 22 pieces, either way. It, we're moving them all up when we do this. And if we just look at the dot network here when it falls, they now fall and they break. Now technically, they were always all broken. They're not even really connected to each other but they're all falling at the same time, and they're not really colliding with each other in any way that matters. So, but then when they actually have to hit each other, when it hits the ground plane, if you want to see the ground plane, we can come back into our, our sim itself, like so. Kablamo. So now you made your, your first fracture. Now the issue here is that well, there's two issues. One issue, which we'll deal with one at a time, is they don't stay together at all. Every piece breaks off. The other issue is these fractures are straight lines. They don't look very realistic. We can fix both. But first, let's deal with the thing completely falling apart. So the bonds that will keep these pieces together are called constraints. There's lots of different kinds of constraints. There's springs, there's glue, there's soft, there's hard, there's slides, there's hinges, there's cones. There's lots of stuff. You know, that's what the later lessons are for. But in this lesson, let's deal with the most commonly used one, which is the glue constraint. A glue constraint basically says this piece is attached to that piece entirely. They don't ever move apart from each other until it's broken, until some threshold of power is, is, forces them to break apart. So, glue. Constraints are going to be made Constraints are polygon lines that connect one piece to another. Or more accurate, they are polygon lines like, you know, here's a line. I can make one myself if I want. But here's a line. It has two points. If we middle click and hold, it's still a polygon, but it is a line. The polygon line where the two points define what two pieces are held together. So if we have name attributes on these two points, and the names will be the names of the actual pieces. And the fact that they're hooked together like this means that that is a way of saying these things should be bound to each other. Let me show you what I mean. Don't take my word for it. So here we go, let's start from here. Let's start from our assembled packed pieces. Now they have a name attribute. They already have point name attributes. So we're actually already halfway there anyway. The most commonly used, most common way of doing this is a connect adjacent pieces. So let's make a, a branch off to the side. We're always gonna have the pieces themselves come into the first input of our sim, but the constraints is a whole separate bit of geometry that's gonna go into the, a different input. So here we go, connect adjacent pieces. So I don't see anything yet. That's because the search radius is quite small. If you middle click and hold and I increase this, you'll see, we'll see some stuff now. So 
that's something. So what am I seeing here? We're seeing some of the pieces are being bound to each other. So that's cool. Um, if I were to take an add SOP, which you don't actually need to use for this, but it'll help visualize it. An add SOP, uh, paradoxically, we can say delete geometry, but keep the points. This is a, a fun way of saying these packed pieces, the packed fragments, they are represented each by a point, as we know. It's the, it's the centroid of each of these fragmented pieces. These are the points that are actually connected together by the connected adjacent pieces. So by the time we get here, what do we have? We have a bunch of polygon lines, and you can ignore this warning here. We have a bunch of polygon lines that connect two points each, and those points are the names of the things that are bound together. So if I were to take, let's say, one of these, so I'm going to click, click it, I'm going to delete it, say delete non-selected, so now I just have the one. It's one line with two points, and those two points are the names of the two pieces that I want to keep, so two and five. We can literally take that knowledge and say something like, I'm going to take a, I'm going to make another one of these blasts coming from this. This is not to make the sim work or anything, but I can say name equals piece two and five. Delete non selected points, and there you go. So these are the two points, the two pieces that are being held together by this. Hope that makes sense. Um, I'd have to go back into this to actually see that. Let's see. There we go. So we can see we have the two different pieces here. And those are the ones that are being held together, just as an example. But in any case, I think we've made that point clear by now. So all of these are hooking together lots of different pieces. I'm going to turn this visualization back off. There we go. But it's still only like kind of a scattershot amount of them. Like it's not a very strong thing where every piece is connected to every other piece. Back on here, we can increase the max connections. Each piece is only allowed to connect to one other piece. So let's bring it up to like four. I mean, you can go beyond five. There's this is you know you can make set this number to whatever you want, but I'm just gonna say four is fine. So that's pretty cool. So now you got a nice little radical looking thing in there. And the last thing we need to do here is actually give it a name. The constraints, because again, there's glue, there's all kinds of things. We need to give it a name so that we can associate these lines with the constraint that we want inside the sim. So make a attribute create. And we'll start using vex soon, but I figure in this first lesson we'll use an attribute create is a primitive attribute. It is a very specific name. Constraint name. It has to be constraint name, and it has to have this underscore, and it has to be lowercase. It's a primitive type. It is a string type. And this part you could call whatever you want. I'm going to call these glue. This seems to make sense to me. So we now have primitive attributes. See this constraint name there. If I click the I, there we go. So the name is a point attribute, but the constraint name is a primitive attribute. And to that, we can plug that into the second input here. That doesn't inherently do anything until we actually have somebody ask for it. So I'm going to make a constraint. <laughs> Can't spell it. A. Constraint network. Make a constraint network here. That takes this in on the left input, and then it wants the constraints themselves here. So let's make a glue constraint relationship. That goes here. The data name has to match up to what we typed before. When we type, when we had that constraint name attribute, we set it to glue the capital G. That's what has to go here. The strength and all that stuff is all here, but there's one more thing we have to do. Second context geometry. See, now it shows up. So that is 
this because this is the second context. Cool. Now, we have an issue. The constraints are down here, whereas our object is up here. Technically, it works because all it's doing is saying the two names of the pieces, but it looks insane. So let us actually fix that. We transformed this up, but we never transformed this up. So what we can do for now, we'll do a better way soon, we can say actions and say create reference copy and put that here. One of several ways we could have done it, but probably the quickest and dirtiest. This is just a whole bunch of expressions pointing back to this one. So it basically is going to do the same thing. So now if I go in here, you'll see the constraints are inside of it. And you better see these. If these don't show up, that means something is wrong. So like if this is wrong, they don't show up. If this is pointing to the wrong thing, they won't show up. So you have to f actually point to the geometry, and it has to hook up here based on the constraint primitive string name. So anyway, we just ran it a few times and I didn't really remark on what we saw. It, it is working. You can see a lot of the pig head is remaining together because it's the bottom that hit and broke and a lot of the stuff at the top didn't really receive enough force to break it. You can play around with this. If you made the glue super strong, you know, it'd be less likely to break as you can see. If we made the glue really weak, it is probably all going to break anyway. Uh, if you like, you can make it negative one, which means never break no matter what. That can be very useful to cluster things together. For now, I'm just going to keep it at the default. Great. So we, maybe we made it a sim. We made a fractured sim. But like I said, the other issue is that these lines are all too straight. So let's fix that too. So obviously, Voronoi is very fast at making many pieces, and the pieces are good themselves for simulation because they're already convex. But they make convex pieces and not much else. So you can cluster lots of convex pieces together to make more interesting shapes, but nonetheless, there is a better way for making uh, higher quality looking fractures, and that's called the Boolean. Boolean is something that has only been really kind of mastered relatively recently. Um, the, there used to be an older Boolean in Houdini called Shatter that didn't work very well. So this was introduced in Houdini 16. In any case, there it is. Uh, we take cutting geometry and then throw it all at a piece and then it will create, it'll cut it along those lines. So totally arbitrary art directable stuff. So in our case, I had a box, I took a grid, I rotated two different ones, I noised them up with the mountain sop, I put them together, but then the boolean actually is set to shatter mode, cut it, as you can see. And then when we explode it, there you go. So obviously that just looks great, and so why would we not just use that? Well, first of all, it's slower than Voronoi, although still surprisingly fast. Um, but another issue is, you know, remember I kept saying convex, convex, convex. Now we have dips in here. I feel like this would be easier to see with the light. Now we have these dip areas, and that's an issue. When we make convex hulls, you know, they will, they will intersect, because these are the convex hulls that are created from that. But as you can kind of see, they're going to plug, they're going to they're gonna interpenetrate each other here. In fact, you can see if I clip inside of it, you can really see the interpenetration now. See? So they're colliding with each other already. Now, Bullet will d does a good job where on the frame that the pieces are first initialized, or when the sim starts, I should say, it will say, oh, am I already intersecting? Like, are these points on my convex hull intersecting another convex hull? Okay, well, then don't count that collision. Because they're already intersecting at the beginning of the simulation, you are excluded from the actual collision detection. Um, 
to other points outside will still collide with the uh, with their neighboring objects, but the points that are inside won't. So that is a good enough way of doing it, but it's still problematic because maybe they should collide. Like, you know, I don't want these to just fall through the bottom ones. So Boolean is good for getting a nice high quality look and you can throw it at your sim and maybe it'll it'll work good enough. It might, um, but it's, it's nice to be able to do both where we do a Voronoi fracture and to make low res geometry, we take those Voronoi pieces, noise them up with mountains or whatever, and then use them to do Boolean cuts so that we have high quality cuts that resemble more or less the lower quality Voronoi. And that's how we end up uh, getting the best of both worlds. And that's what you can either, again, make your own setups to do that, or we can use the one that comes with Houdini now, which is the RBD uh, material fracture node. Okay, so back in our scene here, we're gonna talk about basically rebuilding this network, um, but better, using the RBD workflow tools. Now, the RBD tools, are here. If I press tab, they're all just listed here. There's a bunch of them. We're not going to cover all of them today, but we're going to cover some of the more basic ones to make a straightforward sim, basically to do this and then some. So we've talked a lot about how convex pieces rule the world in the bullet sims and how we can make nicer uh, cuts, nicer shapes with the boolean, and that we can maybe marry the two together by having these be the proxy pieces and the booleans be the high-res ones, and that's exactly what we're gonna get with the RBD material fracture. And the RBD material fracture does a lot of stuff, a lot of convenient stuff for us. And I should also mention, um, you know, right now it's December of 2019, and this is the state of the RBD tools. They're gonna be changing all the time. They've been, they were introduced in, 2000, in uh, Houdini 17, and they are, always being improved, sped up, more features are being added or reorganized. I expect that will continue. And that's the, that's the fate of a high level tool such as this. What I mean by a high level is that if you open it, there's a lot of nodes at a lower level in here. And in fact, not only are there this many nodes, but you could probably pick almost any of them and jump into that. And then there's even more nodes. <laughs> So you can you can kind of like you know keep falling into it. Well, that wasn't that impressive, but there's there's a lot of like sub stuff. So and then here's another sub thing, and so there's a lot going on here. So this is a high level tool because it combines a lot of low level stuff. These are low level things. When I actually make a volume, uh, why is it still showing that? All right. Well, anyway making points, doing the fracture, that kind of stuff. If you ever get this happening, again, for the record, uh, sometimes you can go back in and come out of it to make it fix itself. Sometimes you can do this. If nothing else works, destroy the scene view and then create another one. And now it's gone, just so you know. In any case, um, so these are all low level nodes the things that do the packing, the things that do whatever, whatever. Basically, if you can't go any further inside of it, it's as low as it gets. So I just, that's the whole apply to any thing, is I want you to know all the low level stuff so you can make tools like RBD Material Fracture. Uh, if they change, you can understand what's changed and why. You can modify it to get exactly what you need. But in the meantime, we might as well enjoy it because it does do a lot of stuff that we want and it's better than setting it up ourselves every single time. So without further ado, let's set up using the same pig head from the start. Let's see what it can do for us. So by default, it's gonna make two levels of fractures because there's two tabs here under this primary fracture thing. And what it's gonna do is it's going to make the pieces, it's going to make the constraints, which you recall we did down here, it's the polylines, and it's going to make proxy geometry, meaning the ones that are actually going to be simmed. The proxy geometry is going to be Voronoi convex pieces that snugly fit together very nicely. And then the high-res geometry is just going to go along for the ride. It'll have the same names as the corresponding low-level uh, proxy ones. So let's see what we got here. 
I'm gonna turn off for a second this second fracture, and let's look at the first one. So what are we doing? We're basically saying we have a fracture ratio which says all incoming pieces fracture them because it's set to one. If I set it to zero, no incoming pieces would. If I set it to 50%, half of them would be fractured, half of them wouldn't be. How are they fractured? Well, they're fractured, there's five of them. So this is the same thing. Remember cells, Voronoi cells? It's gonna scatter five points into a fog volume, which again is everything that we did over here already. It's just all rolled up into one package now. So before we even continue with that, let's make another node here, the REBD exploded view. Whenever we have this three output, three input thing, or however many, you can click on the one output, shift click the next one, shift click the next one, and then put it into any one of these and you'll see it automatically does it. So here we go. It's an exploded view, not unlike our regular exploded view over here. But this exploded view will allow us to show the constraints also. And again, that's one of the things this makes for us. This, per this pink line is the constraint geometry. And we can see how these pieces are connected to each other. Now right away, we have that same issue from before, which is the material. So let's copy that over under here. And there you go. So the high res geometry now has the material fix. The low res geometry does not, but it doesn't necessarily matter. So okay. Now I said this is high res geometry, but this kind of just still looks like Voronoi. And that's because it is. However, there's this thing here called detail. Detail, edge detail. It's referring to these edges along like the outside, so the, along the sides of the pieces. Now we can see there's more, there's like the waviness. There's the dips and things that normally wouldn't be allowed in a convex representation. So I'm gonna go back here for a second. I'm gonna turn off proxy geometry. So now you can see a little bit easier. Now we've got controls on this. Um, this waviness can be controlled with the noise height. So I'm gonna make it a lot bigger. Uh, I'm gonna make the whole feature itself be somewhat bigger so that it's not as crunched together. Um, what else we got? We got interior detail, which will affect the surface kind of away from the edge a little bit more. Then I have a pretty high res looking fracture there, which is nice because again, the actual simulated geometry is this, the proxy geometry. Or if we want to look at it a little bit easier, we can look at it like, let's see, I guess I could just do another exploded view. The actual proxy geometry is still just the Voronoi pieces. And that's important because they're going to be, again, they're going to be snugly together, colliding with each other all the time, but in a way that they don't overlap each other. So an easier way is really just to have it be turned on here. So what's nice here too is we have this visualized thing. We can visualize, say, the geometry outside of the proxy. Now, if you try to turn this on, you don't see anything, that might be because you have a different visualizer still on. So look at this Google Maps looking upside down teardrop thing and make sure that it's on, but make sure that the other scene visualizers are off. In any case, so what do we see here? The red areas is the high res geometry when it is outside of its corresponding proxy piece. It's not an error or anything necessarily, but it does mean that this if let's say if this was resting on the ground, this part would be sticking through the ground because really the simulation only the proxy thing is actually being simulated and this is just along for the ride. So we might, if you look closely later on, we might see interpenetrations between the pieces. But the hope is, is that they'd be so small and so slight where the camera's moving or there's a distance or there's motion blur or the shot is too short or it's too dark or any, a million other things that we usually hide little mistakes will be good enough and we won't ever really notice. So I'm gonna put this back to the default. So that's cool. Now what else does RBD material fracture do? I mentioned before, we have two layers here. You can add more layers too. We can have as many as we want. But what they do is just like I said before with the fracture ratio, 
this will take a certain percentage of the lower level's pieces and fracture those. So I could say, for example, don't fracture any of them, and we have the same amount before. But if I did this, fracture half of them, now apparently, by some random chance, it didn't even end up fracturing any. Let's move it up to 0.7. Surely some of these. So now we can see a few of them exploded. And as I keep making this higher, more might explode until we finally get, I just want them all to explode. So that's pretty cool. Now what's nice about this is if I were to do these, let's say visualize the name here, and again, if that's not there, you can always click the I here and click name here to turn it on and off. What's nice is we get these T intersections. That wouldn't happen normally with regular, uh, with one level of fracturing. If I turn this level back off again, we just have, well, we have a little bit, I guess, technically because of our, our edge detail here. But this is really what the underlying proxy pieces are going to look like. So we get these junctions a lot. We get them, they come to points. But by turning on this second layer, we are subdivided the pieces. So you get these really harsh T intersections, which I like. So that's looking pretty cool. And I'll turn the edge detail back on. And it has to refracture everything pretty much every time we make a change on here. So sometimes it can be nice to turn off edge detail get the proxies, meaning get the regular Voronoi to where we want, and then turn edge detail on at the very end. So there you go. So we've got our pieces. Now what else can we do here? One other thing that's really nice about the RBD material fracture is this idea of chipping. This is also introduced, as the whole node was, in Houdini 17, but enabled chipping is really great for adding, uh, in 18 anyway, it was improved about a lot, that it makes all these little pieces that tend to be around like corners and other sharp areas. So if I were to bring this back close a little bit, you can see you get pieces like right here where some other ones all meet. So you get these nice little pieces here and there, and they're great because you want like a variation of sizes on here. I'll just turn these both off for a second. So we have big pieces and we have small pieces. We have a nice variation of pieces, and especially we want a bunch of small ones. So that's pretty cool. Of course, there are you can you can mess with the corner break off and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just gonna keep it at the defaults for now. It's it's pretty much fine. Sweet. Now that we have our pieces, we need to assemble them, right? We need to turn them into packed pieces. So instead of using assemble though, there's another thing here called RBD configure. Like a lot of these high level nodes, it includes some of this stuff. So it includes an assemble node amongst other things. The other things are mostly properties that you can set up on the pieces themselves. So like the assemble node from before, what are you angry about? Like the assemble node from before, uh, we don't see the material anymore, but it's in there. It will be there when we render it later, at least it will in Mantra, and depending on your render. But so we middle click and hold, we have 122 pieces now. Um, it will transfer velocity and angular velocity up from the regular polygonal geometry if it's there. We're gonna talk about those attributes in, a, in the next chapter, or in the next subchapter. Uh, we can set lots of different parameters like bounce and friction and, and things like that. Um, in fact, let's just go talk about those right now. So a lot of times, whether it's with the RBD configure or whether you want to do it yourself via an attribute create as I'm doing it here, a lot of times we want to modify very key attributes that are understood, they're recognized by the RBD or by the packed rigid body solver. Um, you saw earlier on the object itself, on the physical tab, we set things like bounce and friction and mass. But sometimes we need to customize that per piece. We might want to have slight variations of friction or bounce, or we just have very different materials that simply should just have their own frictions, bounces, masses, and so on. So let's go through some of the most common ones. So 
So I've got a pig head, a one rigid pig head here, and a one rigid thing here, this cube-like thing. Um, and let's go through them. So if I just press play, it just falls, nothing special yet. So first thing is V. V is for vendetta, and V is also for velocity. So if I press play now, we created an attribute on the pack geometry that simply says, go up one and go to the right 12. The right meaning the Z axis, which happens to be the axis to the right. If you see that blue Z pointing to the right down there. Cool. Um, these numbers correspond to meters per second. Uh, remember, a second is 24 frames right now. And other things can influence that from happening. For example, hitting something or drag in the air or other stuff. But absent anything else, that's what it will try to do. So that's V. W is similar. It's the angular velocity. It's the spin. So the V just moved the whole thing, but the angular one will make it spin around itself. So here I'm saying rotate 10 around the x-axis. So you can see now it's kind of cartwheeling into it. Whee! Pretty cool. If I turned the V off, they don't need one or the other. It will just cartwheel in place, and it looks like it'll get over there anyway. There's a will, there's a way. So that's fun. So we got V and W. What else we got? Mass. This is an important one. Um, I'm going to turn the mass on on our one on the right also because if one thing has an attribute, they all have to have the attribute and it'll initialize things to default values if they all don't already have it. So here I am saying this thing, the cube. I keep saying it's a cube. I'm going to call it a domino. The domino has a mass of 1,000. Let's say it's kilograms. And this only has a mass of 1. Or rather, it has a mass of 20,000. That's too much. Let's start with one. Bunk. Nothing happens. It's like throwing a pillow at an iron wall. One is just much denser and has more mass. We would not expect, just because of their size, that they should necessarily that they should necessarily win. So bunk at one, nothing happens. At 10, bunk. If you look real closely, it kind of moved. Just a little bit. Oops. If I put out 100, now it just got it over. This is a very key way of expressing weight because I threw it pretty hard. Bam. And it just knocked it over. So you can feel it that this, has, this is a heavier thing. It just bouncing on the ground won't tell you much because the weight won't prevent it from bouncing. But it being knocked over that very much, it being moved by something else with speed, that is that's different. So once I get up to like a high numbers, it's just going to annihilate it. <laughs> it's now looks insane. In fact, it pushed it into the ground. <laughs> Oops. So, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times people just have everything be the same mass, and that's fine. It'll literally work, but it won't feel right. This is a common complaint about CG in film is that it's like it feels weightless because the people ignore properties like this that make a huge, huge difference. I and mean, we just saw the difference between two different ways this can get pushed over. It, the weight matters quite a bit. If they both had the same mass, I mean, they might both have the same mass, but... I don't know. It would depend. All too often, though, it all has the same mass. Anyway, you get it. So no more mass. Turn that back off. What else we got? We got active. Active is pretty straightforward. Um, if active is set to 0, that means it is inactive. It doesn't mean that it's ignored by the sim. It means that it's not moved. It's not solved. It's not evolved by the simulation. It still is interacted with though. So if this has a active zero and this has an active of one, where's my active? There we go. Bunk. Now it doesn't matter how high the mass is on this thing. This thing is just is never going to move. It basically has mass of, of infinity. 
uh, but it's also not subject to forces and things. So this is often used to anchor like a building to the ground where the, the bottom elements of it will be inactive, but then still glued to the rest of the building, uh, for example. Uh, it's also how animation works. If you have animated rigid bodies that are not active yet, they might just be inactive until they become active and then are allowed to interact with the rest of the sim, or rather be moved by the sim. So that's cool. I'm going to say, turn the actives back off again. By default, they are just active. You don't have to make active v1 in order for them to be active. Friction. Friction is one of those things where you don't know what you have until it's gone. So there you go. Actually, let's, let's, let us actually turn this one. Let's have this have super inactivity so it doesn't move. Okay, so now we're back to this. And you should be active also. Okay. So let's just take a, one last look at what friction looks like when it's normal. So it kind of got stuck here on the ground. We could have no friction though. It just slides away like it's ice. Because that's what ice is like. It's frictionless. Same thing. It is really important to express what the materials are is to get the friction right. And then bounce. If I have a very high bounce value, as I do here, boing, there it goes. 10. Quite a bit. We can have it be a normal number. We could even put it at 0. It will still bounce, though. So that's a common issue is that people don't want to bounce at all, and they put it at zero, and it still is moving. Well, that's just one of the limitations of a rigid body sim. Usually, things that you don't want to bounce at all are because, you know, impact is being absorbed through the ground, which is not actually a solid object. It should, it absorbs energy. It's technically a crazy soft body, but in any case, bounce roughly corresponds to how bouncy it is, though. So don't usually have to change this too much, but it would de it'll depend. So there you go. So those are some of the more common properties that you might see. So here we are back in our scene. And one of the last things we needed to do, now that we've you know, turned these into packed geometry, we've got the constraints and all that jazz, um, we just need to move it up and then simulate it. Now, moving it up though is gonna be hard. There's this all had two transforms already, and that was kind of gross enough to have that. Now we have three, and I definitely don't want to do three of these. So fortunately, there is a nice convenient thing here called RBD Pack. It doesn't do that much. It basically just takes these three inputs and turns it into one output. In a way, think of this as an asset. It's as though this is a whole little setup where we have our proxy geometry with the constraints and the high res all packed together now as one thing. Now we can do something to it all at once and then RBD unpack it once we're done with it and it'll come back into being the three things that we're used to. So in our case, I'm gonna grab this, put it here, and now you can see everything was moved and then unpacked. Pretty cool. Um, we can then, from there, jump right to RBD Solver. RBD Bullet Solver, I should say. For the first time now in Houdini 18, the Bullet Solver has a SOP, meaning surface operator, meaning geometry level representation. We don't need to build it ourselves as we have here. So there's a lot of, there's a bunch of inputs on here, but as usual, we only need the first three. The other ones we'll talk about later, they're not necessary. So we just start with this, go to ground, add ground, uh, add ground plane. I don't really see it. Ah, there it is. Press play. And there you go. It's beautiful. Now it's technically working. We can see, we know that there's multiple pieces in here and we can see the constraints still. Uh, it's probably just too strong. The defaults were back up here 
on the material fracture under the constraints tab. We can knock off one of these zeros here, and you can see the chipping actually gets a, a separate a separate thing. I'm going to say, considering that this was 10,000 and the chipping glue strength it was half of that, when I knock this down, I'm going to say copy parameter, paste relative references here, oopsies, and then I want to, I'll say times 0.5. So that'll just keep it, keep them in sync with each other. Cool. So now, coming back down to this, let's see what happens now. There you go. Now it breaks. And more importantly is it doesn't all break apart. It's just largely broken. We still have some big chunks up here. Cool. So that definitely works. So the RBD bullet solver has an insane amount inside of it. If you double click on it, it brings you all the way down into the bottom, into the dungeon here, into the forces area. This is where you would add like wind or other forces and things like that, force fields, explosion fields. Uh, we'll talk about that in the next lesson. But for now, I want to show you the DotNet itself. We built our own version of this a minute ago. It's all still the same thing. Here's the RBD object, which was the container that stored the geometry. Here's the constraint network that had that we took that, and then we had the glue constraint, which is sitting here, and then you know comes into the merge and comes out to here. What else? We've got the ground plane. The ground plane has the merge with the collision relationship. Here's our gravity. Here's the bullet solver. It's all here. Uh, it's also just a lot more stuff. In this way, we don't need to set up all of the stuff ourselves. I mean, I often like to set it up anyway because I don't want all this extra stuff, and I know that I'm going to need to do custom stuff anyway. Uh, you'd have to unlock this node, and it's just, it just would be kind of messy. But for many common things like this, you don't need to do that. So we might as well take advantage of this RBD bullet solver thing. Also, if you're interested, you look in the constraints subnet here. You can see all the different constraints that are available. Glue, soft, hard, pin, slider, cone twist, spring. Those are all, all of our friends. So that's pretty cool. The other nice thing is uh, if you are a studio, you know, a Houdini FX license is much more expensive, and you need that license to do modifications here in the Dynamics area. So that's the same as over here when we were building this. You need to be able to manipulate things in here, and to do that, you need to have an FX license uh, or just a regular indie or whatever. But I think it's usually just called the FX there's a cheaper license that a lot of studios get that does not allow you to do stuff in here, but SideFX has graciously allowed you to still do dynamics by having them abstracted here out to the, the SOP level. So anyway, that's just a little fun thing for you to know about. Cool, so there it is. That works. And uh, let's do one more thing, and then I think we'll be ready to render. So the last thing I want to do is really take advantage of the fact that these are packed. One of the great things about this system in Houdini is not just that it's in Houdini and it's easy to manipulate things, it's the packed idea that it is shared memory, that is an instanced memory. Remember that whole crazy cube of all the different pig heads and how they didn't actually really take up any more memory than one of them? Well, we get to take advantage of that. So I have this so-called asset here of all these unique pieces in this pig head, but what if I had many of these fracturable pig heads? Well, now I can have a crazy sim of tens of thousands of pieces, but it doesn't actually take up much more memory than just one. So we can have an insane sim, but they're still, even the rigid, the simulation pieces are still sharing memory. So let me show you what I mean. So right when we got to this point, where we had our, our asset all packed up, I'm gonna say, let's copy, let's duplicate these a bunch of times. So here's a box. I'm gonna put some divisions on it. And I'm gonna use these divisions to copy these onto. So, there you go. Like so, so there you are. Looks amazing. Let's actually make this box a lot bigger. So I'm just gonna say like, you know, something like that, doesn't really matter. Um, let's see, 
Maybe it's too much. I kind of want to keep them a little bit closer together. So something like that. And we can move the whole thing up because it's still kind of intersecting the ground. So I'm going to move the whole thing up to like up here so that it can actually fall from a distance. We can rotate them some crazy amount like that, that they will all fall. And while we're at it, let's orient them randomly. So I'm going to do a attribute randomize. You know, when we have when we just have these points, it'll just put them on that point. But if we give it a normal, a random normal, it will have it orient to that random normal. So I'm going to say, give me a random normal inside of a sphere, which is basically a fancy way of saying, just give me a, a vector that points in a random direction. And that's the direction that this pig head faces. So then again, we move it, we move it up like so. I think there's too many of these. I'm going to do like that. That's good. You know, even if it doesn't take up more memory, having more pieces is still something that has to be solved. They still have to collide with each other, so it'll still take up processing power. Uh, so just be aware of that. Looks like I lost my bar on the side. Cool. So that's pretty red, and we can unpack them all, and we're back to, we have 4,300 things here. Now, here's the rub, though. If I try to sim this, it's not going to work. In fact, we can already see it not working. What will happen eventually when it gets down there um, is that these pieces all, a lot of them have the same names. So any, a, let's say there's a given fracture piece in this pig head here. It might be called fracture or piece 25. There's gonna be a piece 25 in each one of these pig heads. But the constraints, if you recall, the constraints are based off of the name of the pieces. So that doesn't work. They need to have new unique names. So let's see what happens here. <laughs> it's like going through the ground. Well, that I can't even explain that, but it's it's gonna be it's wrong either way. So come back. All we need to do is go to enforce unique name attribute per instance. That's it. So let me show you why that's all we need to do. So if you don't have a geometry viewer, I mean, my Houdini crashed before, so uh, I lost mine. So I'm just gonna make mine again. So again, set pane type, viewer, or rather inspectors, geometry spreadsheet. So here's the names with this on. With it off, it loses that last number. So looked at another way, we have 36 points in this box that we're instancing to. So, as you can kind of see, there's a whole, there's a lot of pieces with the same exact name. In fact, there's probably around 36 of them. If I turn this on, you'll see they all get a unique name now. And not only that, the constraints also do. Eh? Eh? Which is important, because the constraints point to the original pieces. So it's nice that we just have this very convenient thing right here to automatically update all their names, something that we used to have to do ourselves. And in fact, we did almost the exact same thing in the original Applied Eugenie Rigids 1, but now it's even easier. So cool. So with even so with fewer top level nodes, as you can see here, than this side, we've accomplished something much more complicated. So let's see. Let's run this and see what we get. I'm going to go to here, click and hold this, go to Flipbook with new settings. A Flipbook is like a Play Blast and Maya or whatever else. It's just a preview animation of our viewport. And as long as it looks fine, if you want, you might want to make your the size of it smaller or something to take up less memory. It just depends on what you need to do. So just click, click Start. And we'll, I'll let this run. It'll probably take a minute or two. And then we'll, we'll take a look at the result. And there you go. It only took a couple minutes. Actually, maybe it only took one minute. Yeah, two minutes. Anyway, so yeah, so it worked. Everything worked great. And it looks cool. Smash, smash, smash.
I like the, you know, you get the big chunks, you get the small chunks. I really like seeing this one come apart in the air. That's pretty cool. That's what I mean. Um, yeah, rad. So, good enough. Um, I would point out a few little things like, see these little pieces down here? They're moving a little funky. It's probably because their collision, their actual proxy geometry doesn't quite match up with them. It's like a little off center. You might just want to delete pieces like that rather than worry too much about it. You can delete them like right when they when the crash happens. You wouldn't even notice them going away. You do that all the time. Um, yeah, but in any case, looks pretty good. So let's cache this out. I'm gonna do a file cache on here. There are technically more efficient ways of caching this out, but this is the most straightforward way. So we're just gonna do that. So job slash sim slash smash cache dot cache dot smash dot version zero dot frame number dot bgo dot sc. Bgo dot sc is the Houdini's file format. So it's probably still in memory anyway, so if we click save the disk, it'll probably go by pretty fast. And it does. In fact, it did it so fast that it couldn't write to the disk that fast. I love it when that happens. And there it is. So now you can click load from disk, and we'll just read it from the disk instead of from the sim. I'll put a null here after it, and we'll point to this later when we do rendering. In fact, we're going to do that right now. So save it, and I'll see you in rendering chat. So we're going to render this now. Um, obviously, this is Houdini 18, which means that Solaris is with us, the aka the lighting operators that live over here in the stage area. This uses the universal scene descriptor to lay out scenes in a, in a different way than what is normally here in Houdini land. Uh, it's super cool. It's going to be great for rendering lots of stuff at once, lots of different assets. Uh, Karma is the renderer now over there. It will, I'm told, be replacing Mantra over time. But that said, not yet. Karma is new. It's in beta, at least as of the time of this lesson being recorded. And there's really no reason to use it in this chapter, in this lesson rather. It's missing a lot of stuff right now. It's not any fast, faster than Mantra. In fact, it seems to be a little bit slower. It's going to get there. Uh, it's going to be GPU enabled. So something like Redshift maybe, where it's taking advantage of that to render much faster. But all it is to say, we're not going to use it. I mean, for all I know, you want to render this in Redshift anyway. I don't know. So this lesson is not about LOPS is the point. It's not about Solaris. It's not about karma. This lesson is about the rigids, and you can render them however you want. Now, I am going to show you, though, how to render it in Mantra, because Mantra is still pretty good, and will do this job quite nicely. So, let's do that. Let's turn this off. We never want to, like, or actually, no, let's start with, let's start with it. I was going to say, we never want to render directly from the nodes that we do our work in, because we might accidentally keep our display on something else like this. And if I then if I render this node, I'd just be rendering that. So that's useless. So let's make a geometry node. And I, I like to prefix these with R and DR. And I like to make them red. Makes them go faster. So if I do object merge, I can go get that out node here. And now this will always render the right thing because it is only a node that points to the right thing, like so. So that's cool. So we got that. Uh, we also want a ground plane. Actually, what we really want is camera. So before we even make our ground plane, let's think about our where we'll be looking from. So you figure by the time we get to the end of this sim, it's at about here. So something like that. I want to make sure that it, none of them start in frame. 
They probably don't actually. If I control click now, you can see they're in the gray area there. So I control clicked on the camera, and there you go. That's pretty cool. We got a camera. What else do we want? We want a ground plane. So I make another, like, let's say, working node. So I'll call this ground plane. I'll make them green because that makes them work better too. Put a grid down. Looks like we're already pretty well aligned with the camera, actually, which is was not planned, but normally I would just say put a transform node down after that rotate it so that it is aligned with the camera. There we go. Uh, and more importantly, make it bigger, like so. I'm gonna put this into smooth wire shaded. I wanna see those lines. We needed to extend past the sides of the screen and past the back of our sim because I wanna grab in point selection mode, S2, grab the points, press T to translate them up, and turn the grid itself into a NURBS. That way it curves up like this. So now I look at the camera, I have a background, essentially. Great. So much like this node, in fact, let's just copy and paste this one. We'll say render ground. Then you could press like, you can hold the Alt key down and yeah, oh, there you go. So you can hold the Alt key down and click and drag to duplicate things too. So that's pretty fun. Anyway, so the ground here will point to ground plane. Oh, we never put an out node there. I can hear some of you screaming that at me and I didn't hear you. Sorry. There you go. So copy that. So you can always just copy a node and it'll it will copy the node but it'll also copy just the path to the node too. So I can just control V that here. So now the things we're seeing are the two render nodes. Cool. Save that. What else do we need to do? We need to make a material. And you can make a material here and then you can rename it up here. So I'm gonna say this one's called ground. We'll figure out a color soon, but let's just, we just have it for now. So we'll assign this here. So there you go. So this is a ground material. This doesn't have a material here, but the pig head has one internally. And we created that other material that goes, went on the inside of the faces. So you'll see how those all come together in a minute. Before we finish, go to sampling, turn motion blur on, or rather velocity blur on the pigs one. Ground plane doesn't really need it. And because we are using Mantra, at least in this example, go to the out context here, put a Mantra node in, get there, there it is. The Mantra node is going to use our camera. It should have a frame range that is our scene. We need to have a path here. So we'll do it in terms of job again, which is the project that we set up earlier. So job slash render slash cool frames dot version zero dot the frame number dot EXR this time. EXR is the kind of industry standard image format at this point. So that's pretty cool. And under rendering, we want to do physically based rendering. We don't want to allow motion blur. And the objects should be not to turn off candidate objects, turn on RNDR star so that it's going to find the two render ones and render those only, no matter what is on or off. So even if these were off, it'll still render those two. Great. So that's about it. And now uh, let's actually light this in the next chapter. So let's actually start rendering it. And to do that, we can use the render view. So click render. And while we're waiting, we can click this thing. We can zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole image. Um, as we go, we'll take little snapshots with this little camera down here so we can have a bunch of things we can compare and see our progress as we go. So there you go, not bad for a first shot. So I'm just gonna turn that 
click that so we have a snapshot. Um, first thing we know we need is a light. There are no lights in here yet. It's just making a default light for us right now. So I'll make an environment light. Uh, I'm gonna say clip to positive Y hemisphere. So it's like a dome light. We don't care what's below ground. Um, right now it's white, which is something, but let's actually go to the Houdini file system, HDRI area, choose the garage or whatever else. I just like the garage because it has like a nice light coming just from the top. So you can see we look, we're looking better already, right? You can click and hold in an area if you want to focus the, uh, the thing on it, on the, the rendering power on it. Cool, so click that. That seems all right. Let us, we don't see the actual material though from the pig head. So that's an idiosyncrasy of Mantra. Um, although I suspect it will affect most renders, the material for the pig head is kind of locked inside of the pig head. Specifically, if we go back to the pig head node here, you'll see it's all the way inside of it down here in this subnetwork, as opposed to the like general material area here where we have our ground and inside shaders. So what we need to do is go to the Mantra node, go to the rendering tab, then the render sub tab, and go down to the bottom and change this to save all materials and shaders. So we need to actually click this render button in order for that to, to take effect. Most of the settings on the renders themselves, so the Mantra one in particular, if you change the actual settings on here that affect the geometry and how it's saved out, you'll have to do that. So okay. So we've got that. Um, Yours may look different than mine, depending on what the default settings came in on for the principled shader. But basically, we want it to be white. We want it to not be reflective. We want it to be very rough. So it looks like this. So it has a kind of a ceramic look, I think. It looks pretty good for this. So that seems all right. Um, it's kind of dark, though. The whole image is kind of dark. If I press I, I can bring up the inspector and see the luminance values are, are pretty low, depending on what I'm looking at anyway. So I'm going to go back to our light, make it twice as bright. So that's looking better. I mean, it's blown out in some spots, but I think it's looking more interesting overall. So I'm going to click our snapshot again. So we've come from here to here to here. Um, I'm going to say the ground for one it should be blue. It should not be reflective. So right now it has kind of like a plasticky, metallic-y look to it. So I'm going to turn reflectivity down to zero here. I'm going to go to this. I'm going to say make it a little more sophisticated, like periwinkle look, something like that. That seems fine. The interior is too bright now. I'm going to bring it down like, oh, not you. Well, that happens. So you can see that the, the background changed. That can happen because you either accidentally had them both selected, or in our case, it's just wrong. Um, I'm going to come back to this again. You can see the background, the base for the ground is still blue, but it's not here. You can solve that in two ways. You can either just go to a previous frame. It's something to do with the caching in the render. And you can see it's right now. I don't really know why that is. Um, or you can click the render here and actually redo it. In any case, it's largely fixed. So we made the interior darker. Oh, it's probably too dark now. All right, good enough. And then... The last thing we'll need to do is, no, it's actually pretty good. It's a little bright, that's okay though. Cool. So what else do we wanna do here? We wanna make sure that their motion blur is working, that's for sure. Um, snapshot. So I'm gonna find like a frame where they're still falling and I wanna see that the motion blur works. I mean, I imagine it is, but let's just make sure. It, it is, good. So I'm gonna come back to this. The last thing we wanna do is, 
these renders pretty fat this render is pretty fast um, there's not a lot of geometry in the scene this is pretty reasonable so we can spend some time we can spend some render power on the idea of bounce lighting so right now there's no like reflective light coming back off the ground so especially in areas like this this is pretty dark but it really shouldn't be so i'm going to say go to the mantra node go to the uh, where are you rendering limits and make the diffuse limit go up one in fact, I'll go back here. Let me go to the frame that we were at so we can compare it easier. The diffuse limit is the limit of how many bounces we can do. We probably only need one bounce. It's very expensive, but again, considering how fast this render is anyway, we can afford it pretty easily. So here we go, diffuse limit one. And so now it's lighter over here. So if I go back here, you can see how much different it is. You can see it happening everywhere. In fact, you can see blue splashing up onto the bottom. It really helps integrate things into the same universe, like so. You can see it happening all over the place. Not so much happening on the top, because they're not, they're just facing the air. There's no splash coming from too much else. But a lot of these darker underbellies here are, are looking much better. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think maybe this is a little too bright. So I'm gonna bring this down a little bit more. It's so annoying that you have to do that. At any rate, um, yeah, now it's not quite so blown out, but still pretty bright. So good, so we got there. We didn't really do that much craziness here, but this will look really nice to make our actual render. Uh, I'm gonna render this now. You might, you know, delete some little errant pieces if you want, um, but I think it's probably fine. We'll talk more in the following lessons about how to control little pieces that are moving too much or they're rolling too much or all kinds of little things like that. But I think we covered a lot already in this first lesson, so let's just keep it there. And look how far we came in our render. I always like to have at least one of these little progression things. I just like the way they look. Cool. Very good. So we'll stop it. We'll go to our out area. I'm going to save it. Frame range. Remember, it's all set. And that's it. Just click render to disk. And then we'll look at it and we'll be done. All right. All done. And there it is. Pretty cool. I'm glad we spent the uh, extra time on getting the bounce lighting in, the, the fuse limit, because these, these only took a minute of frame on my computer here, so certainly worth it. Um, we can see kind of what we said would happen, where if you look at this piece here, right on that frame in fact, you can see how it goes below the surface of the ground, because the high res is sticks out from the proxy geometry. Apparently, the Voronoi edge was there. We can't usually tell though. You could always tweak that piece a little bit using like a transform sop or something if it really, really mattered. Most of the time in film, we don't have shots that are even this long uh, or the camera's moving or who knows what else, like I said earlier, would be hiding it. But we'll talk about strategies to, to deal with some of that stuff. Over here too, we can see like the way this piece is moving it's because it's not really quite matching what the proxy piece looks like. Um, you know, it's close, but it's not quite the same. That's always going to be the trade-off between the high res and the proxy, is that they don't quite match up. But for the most part, we can't really tell. You know, especially in the smash em up area, which is where most of the action is, we can't really tell. So it looks great, though. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning about transformations and pack geometry and instancing and Voronoi and Boolean shatters and the RBD workflow and proxy pieces and 
constraints, glue constraints, setting up DOP networks, doing all kinds of stuff, probably other things that I didn't think of. We, we covered quite a bit in this lesson, and we even had a chance to render it so it looked kind of cool too. Uh, yeah, one little bonus thing before you go. Obviously, this was a render in Mantra, but uh, now that we have a light here, our viewport can actually benefit from this light. We can go to here, or even here. This is the high quality rendering mode in the viewport. It's actually pretty fast. I mean, here it is without lights, and it's pretty much the same speed because it has to actually keep reading all this from the disk. But the high quality mode here, almost the same speed. So that's pretty cool. I went ahead and make it, made a flipbook of it too. So if you're into that, this is a, a flipbook result. Pretty crazy. What a day to be alive that it looks that good. Um, yeah, and hopefully karma will be even faster once that gets going. But in the meantime, enjoy our mantra renders while we still have them. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson, and uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Contact at applytodini.com. I will always respond to you. Take care.